it's uh, less of a question and more of an advertisement. Um, so JATS is really important, uh, but it's quite a loose standard. It can be implemented in many different ways. So I just want to let people know that there's a little working group called JATS for reuse. And what we're trying to do is get people who use JATS to agree best practice. So it's not a standardization process, but it's asking the question, if you want to tag mathematics or if you want to tag licensing, there are many ways to do it within the standard, but let's all try and agree on a single way. And so I just point people to that. Um, and the nice thing about it is we provide XSLT style sheets, which can be uh, checked on the web. So you can check your XML directly and get immediate feedback to see if the XML that you're producing as a publisher passes the recommendation. Ian, how does one find out about that group? Google it? Yeah, yeah it's it probably a good start, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's numeral 4org mm. dot org. And then an R. So, yes, it, so just try Google. <laughs> <laughs> We've got any more questions? Yep, the front here, please. My name is Son Ho from Korea. Uh, I'd like to ask a question to uh, Leti, Miss Leti Lagas. Okay, you mentioned on on the access license and the open process is not the exact term. Yeah, therefore you suggest the license the free to read at first and yeah. the another the right to use will be discussed later and. Uh, to have any plan to define the uh, gold process, the green process, or a plat platinum process in in using a license? Do you have any plan? The question was that the uh, license ref tag uh, links, and as I understand, so make sure I repeat your question appropriately, um, that the uh, uh, license tag links just to, oh, this works? That's more comfortable, thank you. <laughs> uh, the license tag simply links to a publisher provided uh, um, version of the license, um, and it currently doesn't label anything gold, green, further. Um, I don't think that the ALI um, project will create those definitions. I could be wrong. There may be uh, more of a need for it coming from the community, but there aren't any plans at this time to make um, labels more specific within the tags. Yep. Gentleman there. I've got the microphone. Uh, is it working? Yeah. Uh, so I'm Pablo de Castro from uh, LIBER, the uh, Association of European Research Libraries. This is a, a comment as well as a question on uh, standardization of funding information. So Stephen Pinfield mentioned FundRef, which is uh, very good, of course. But uh, with with my funder head on, hat on, I, I wonder to what extent it could be uh, fine-tuned into a grant uh, a standardization, a project standardization for assessing the impact of uh, specific projects. This is, of course, also relying on researchers and authors declaring their funding at, at manuscript submission time. So similar to what you mentioned for ORCID, uh, maybe widening the basis. But, but this is uh, a need that many funders uh, feel, I think. I, I can f foresee issues around. Uh, I can foresee issues around how different funders actually characterise their grants. You know how they number them and all that kind of thing that could cause issues. Um, but I agree, it would be um, very useful in order to be able to track impact and and so on. Once again, it does rely on very broad take up in terms of authors themselves, as you have said. And that does create problems unless systems can be put in place at institutional level that prompt authors or that incentivize authors to do it. It can be quite a problem. I'll just add to that. I mean, we so we don't um, going back to Orchid. We don't demand Orchids yet, but I think there'll be a point where we will do, just because it's going to be so valuable for us to have those Orchids. 
um, and speaking to one of my counterparts today at another society, they've been monitoring the take up of orchids um, for people submitting papers and it's about 10%. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, if, if we're serious about rolling this out, then it's, it's, it's not gonna be the publishers that will encourage this, it's the institutions and the funding bodies. Um, and when you get people like the Wellcome Trust coming out and saying, you know, if you want your grant, you have to have an orchid, um, then, you know, there's, there's a carrot there as well as a stick. It's a two-way thing, isn't it? I submitted a journal article recently, and there was nowhere to, to put my orchid. You know, so uh, it, it's a two-way thing. There has been a recent contribution of uh, something called the Contributor Role Taxonomy, or credit, and it's been advanced both to the orchid community as well as submitted as an um, uh, extension to the Contributor Role in the JATS. Um, so it's, if you go to JATS and look at the discussion areas, you'll find credit or contributor role. And one of those contributions is funding. So recognition of the funder as a, a firmly identified tag in every JATS XML might go a long way to help see both where the money's being spent <laughs> and the recognition that funders should get as well. Richard over here. Um, I'm a little hazy with the access part of the access and license indicator tag. I'm wondering sort of out loud um, uh, who will be the main u users of that in terms of what, what will be done with it. Um, I'm wondering, for example, whether it will mainly be publishers who will use it uh, in order to affect how particular items are displayed on their websites or whether it will be more for intermediaries and librarians to, to, to use. My slight uh, concern that if publishers use it uh, in order to, shall we say, um, uh, place a particular indicator against a title that is free to read, that that might actually mean that if, if that is there and is irremovable, that if you're doing a search on a library interface uh, and getting a set of results which are both uh, free to read and free to read to your members because uh, you have licensed the content, there might be certain assumptions that if there isn't the free to read thing there, you might not think it's free to read and you might not click on it, which can't be what, what we want. On the other hand, it would certainly seem to me that such a tag uh, has the potential to resolve the issue of um, discovery services not um, indicating items in hybrid journals uh, uh, which are free to read if your institution doesn't subscribe to them. The original premise of the work, um, when it began as an idea, a glint in the eye of people who were discussing this, was to help um, create a visual indicator in the first instance that you described um, so that I can, and, and also to help um, perhaps with data that's sent to link resolvers um, to help indicate to users that this is something I can access. Um, the, the visual indicator logo part was dropped as part of the scoping of the work, so that didn't come to fruition and the group decided to concentrate on the metadata, but it is um, not meant to describe free to read if your institution has a subscription. It is meant to describe this is free to read Anyone on the web can access this without authentication, without logging in. Um, in any, it just I can get to it and I can read it. Does that help well, with your question? It, it does. I mean, it certainly means that if that anyone on the web, in your terms, it is an advantage. But if you're actually looking at that within, say, a result set from within, uh, from within an institution that has a lot of licensed material, mm -hmm. it could be confusing. Yes. That doesn't have that symbol might it, it is likely still to be available. True. I think it probably depends on um, the inaction and the the you know we'll we'll see the proof in the pudding I suppose and then make changes if we need to. Yeah. Good point.
Uh, yeah, thanks. So it was a very, very interesting um, set of talks. And this is probably a very naive question, which either means it's a straightforward answer or not. Um, one of the things that was mentioned was the, the license tag. Um, and I'm guessing that means whether it's um, NC or ND or whatever, CCBY, other stuff I don't understand. Um, has there been any work done on a standard framework for describing a publisher or journal open access policies in a standard way? Not at NISO, but perhaps in other venues. Anyone else? Yeah. Okay, I've got a question actually. Um, so, what I wanted to know and, and see what the panel's opinions on this are is, is how can we ensure that standards are well known, um, interoperable, and adopted widely and quickly by the whole community? I'll have a go. Um, so I, I think one of the inherent challenges um, is that people tend to go off and do their own thing, not always, and that's why you know, institutions like yours exist. But, um, you know, we, I think in the UK we're, we're, we're falling into the trap sometimes of trying to do our own thing. And I know JISC is a great organisation, but I think sometimes it, it thinks about the UK without thinking about the rest of the world. Um, so, you know, we have to remember we're, we're a global community here, we have to be doing this internationally. Um, and we have to recognize that, you know, we might, for example, we might have a very big focus on open access here, but not so much in the rest of the world. Um, and I think until we can find a way to bring all the stakeholders together, not just across countries, but across, um, you know, technology, people, publishers, um, the political angle as well, um, <laughs> this isn't going to be very nice. The, it gets driven by geeks, because geeks are the people that get interested in the standards, and you need to engage people that aren't just the techie people. You need to engage the people who are using this stuff on the ground. Okay. Does anyone else got any thoughts on that? <laughs> I think having all the right people around the table is absolutely essential. It seems to me, because if different communities have an input into the design of standards, they're more likely to then to adopt them. Mm. It's when you feel like you're being somehow excluded and you're having a standard that doesn't fit your requirements that you're less likely to adopt it. So getting those discussions right is important. And, you know, just commenting on on the, uh, the comment about JISC, for example. Mm -hmm. JISC, there, are, there aren't many organisations like JISC worldwide, SURF is a kind of a, an analogous organization in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is considerably smaller in terms of numbers of institutions, mm -hmm. though, and can do things in a more coordinated way. But when JISC wants to speak to people, say, in the United States, who do they speak to? That's their opposite number. So there is a problem here about uh, just getting the right people around the table. In my experience, and I'm not a paid-up member of JISC or anything, but in my experience, JISC have been done a brilliant job in, in driving this, in, in kind of establishing those discussions, and actually are often looked to, and the UK is often looked to, in a kind of leadership role in the area of open access, for example. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't stop us trying to forge new ways ahead, um, mm -hmm. in, it just because other people have got to catch up. So that's, that's what I would say. But, you know, just because through things like activities like the Knowledge Exchange yep. and so on, has done a reasonable job in trying to bring other countries that you can talk to uh, together. But it is an ongoing challenge. There's no doubt about that. Okay. Now, question towards the back there. Thank you. Hi there. It's uh, Stuart Maxwell from Scholarly IQ. Um, I should also declare I also work with Nettie on some of the NISO uh, information topic committees and, and the altmetric stuff. Uh, and just wanted to say in that uh, it's more of a comment, really, that just in addition to sort of the development of the standards, there's also the ongoing stuff about sort of the governance of it as well mm -hmm. and where responsibilities uh, for continuation and um, because uh, standards without any form of making sure there's adherence to it. Uh, kind of makes a lot of work worth just a piece of paper. Um, and so, you know, for sort of people's participation is also maybe uh, uh, thinking how also in governance, when these things come out, what are the next steps that, that go on as well? 
uh, I think is another consideration about making standards work for the community is, is, is a big aspect on, on that side. That's a good point. Okay, I've got another question. Um, what's, what are the next areas to look at? Where are, we, where are we looking ahead in terms of scholarly publishing or the scholarly communications um, where there are standards that are going to be needed or, or that are in, going to be emerging? Data. <laughs> uh, data identifiers. Uh, data citation. Um, okay, that's true. But sharing, sharing that broadly, broadly. Uh, so I think data archiving. I think we've got data citation, you know, that's moving forward, but data archiving and journal policies around when you should archive, you know, how open should it be? Um, we've been looking at this because we launched this data journal and it turns out that we want to have a mandatory data archiving policy, but you know, many people don't have a policy. Some it's optional, some it's not. Um, that's a bit of a mess. I think the other one we should be starting to look at is the whole question of um, how publishers offset um, APC charges against subscriptions because everyone's doing their own thing and um, if you're a librarian, this must just be a complete nightmare. So I think as a publishing industry, we, we need to kind of forge forward with a standard for that. Yeah, I don't have any great additional ideas, do you? No. No, I, I'd say, <laughs> um, no, I definitely agree with the data thing. I'm glad it wasn't me that first suggested the offsetting thing, because it might have been me, but I, I agree that that's important. Just uh, the other thing to say is, it's important, uh, and I tried to make this point in relation to say counter, but also it applies to our OAI PMH, that we, those are well-established standards that we do ha make effort to see through the benefits mm. that they promise, to, to be reality on the ground and not just say, well, the standard works. Mm -hmm. If it's not working on the ground, it's, it's, it's not as good as useless, but it's got to deliver on the benefits, and we ought to put some sustained energy into that as well. So ultimately, it gets utility. Yeah. Yeah, it's really about the utility. Okay. Um, I'm just going to bring something up that uh, Len mentioned earlier as well, um, just as a question. This might be more of a question for Nettie, but I'd like everyone's opinion if you've got one, um, about when guidelines become standards. What's the, what's the real difference, and when do these things really become a standard? No. Um, at, at NISO, we have been publishing more, since I joined NISO in 2011, we have published many more recommended practices than we have standards. And uh, as I mentioned, the general idea is that a recommended practice can be developed more quickly and it can be updated more quickly. It doesn't have the whole process that is imposed by our ANSI audited standards. And that's a good thing and it's a bad thing. But I think um, people also, um, sometimes would like to have a, a more codified standard. I don't really have a, um, there's no hard and fast rule on that. Um, we have a notion that a recommended practice could become a standard, but since I've been at NISO, certainly none of that has come to pass for any recommended practice, although it could happen. Uh, we have had uh, material from other organizations become standardized, so JATS is an example of a de facto standard that became an official standard. Um, my feeling is that something is adopted or it isn't, uh, something is followed or it isn't, and whether it's a community practice and people are all talking the same language, that's the most important thing, not whether or not it is a codified something or other. Others have thoughts on that. I just want th things to be used, <laughs> the community to talk to each other. Um. You may find it difficult to believe, but we did actually coordinate uh, before this session on what we would and wouldn't say. <laughs> and and one, of th one of the things that we decided not to do specifically was kind of go into what definitions of what standards yeah. are, because we thought that might close off some of the debate. Because there is a fluid situation here, isn't there, where community practice becomes guidelines, becomes standards. And actually, we shouldn't think of, of, of one as sort of a, a bad thing that might lead to a good thing. Actually, they could all be good things and could all be appropriate in different situations. It's quite interesting to me, though, that many standards do require the extra stuff built mm. around them in terms of the guidelines about how you actually in, you know, implement them. Yeah. And is that 
that does that mean the standard itself is inadequate, or does it is that just an inevitable consequence of as people start to implement it? I think that's an interesting question. If you need a lot of additional discussions about how to make JATS work, for example, does it mean the standard itself needs updating? And maybe we there ought to be a mechanism for reviewing it in that kind of way. Um, I think that's a really good point in that you can actually make the standard so burdensome that it it becomes difficult to adopt and therefore doesn't really gain traction. Um, so yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think we're about out of time, so unless anybody else has a, um, a final question, I'm not seeing any hands, I would like you to join me in thanking our four excellent speakers this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>